Jesus.com. Paul and Jesus' statement concerning food sacrifice to idols has been no small debate and has created a great controversy within the church, even to the point of people saying that everything written by Paul should be thrown away or taken out of the Bible. They like to cite the supposed contradiction between his and Jesus' statement, but under a closer look and when read in context, we'll find no controversy concerning food sacrifice to idols and if Christians should eat such food produced by pagan religious practices. Okay, next part it says the church concluded the following Acts 15 19 through 20. It says, Therefore, my judgment is that we don't trouble those from among the Gentiles who turn to God, but that we write to them that they abstain from the pollution of idols, from sexual immorality, and from what is strangled and from blood. Right? And so he said, This is what we're going to tell them to do. This is the controversy because. Paul seems like he goes against this later, which we're going to cover. But what does Jesus have to say on this, right? He's the definitive source. Let's look at what Jesus has to say. Jesus also declares this to be wrong in Revelation 2.14. But I have a few things against you. You have some people there who follow the teachings of Balaam, who instruct Balak to put a stumbling block before the people of Israel so they would eat food, sacrifice to idols, and commit sexual immorality. So Jesus is like, this is to the churches. He's like, listen, I have this against you. You have people saying they eat, it's okay to eat food, sacrifice to the idols, and the big giant and commit sexual immorality. Let's see what Paul was teaching on this subject. 1 Corinthians 8, 1-13. 1 Corinthians 8, 4. With regard then to eating food sacrificed at idols, we know that an idol in this world is nothing, and that there is no God but one. If after all there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, one Father, for whom all things and for whom we live, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we live. But this knowledge is not shared by all. And some, being accustomed to idols in former times, eat this food as an idol sacrifice, He's making a distinction, and their conscience, because it is weak, is defiled. Now food will not bring us closer to God. Right? We are no worse if we do not eat or do, or no better if we do eat. He's talking about food sacrifice to others. He's saying it doesn't matter. It's just food. First uh, Corinthians 10, 23-31. This is what Paul says. Also controversial. Everything is lawful. Well, they're, that, you know, to a group of people that want to put a law on everything. He's going, everything is lawful, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is lawful, but not everything builds others up. Do not seek your own good, but the good of the other person. Eat anything that is sold in a market without question of conscience. The meat that was sold in these pagan markets were sacrificed to idols. Okay? He said, eat it. You don't have to worry about it. It's just food. It almost appears that Paul is now contradicting, contradicting the early church, the letter he helped deliver in Jesus and Revelation. Yet, if we take the full counsel of his writings, we'll fill in a murky picture. Cherry-picking statements without full context can lead the misguided people to come to fatal conclusions. Let's pray. Dear and Father, we praise you. Thank you so much that we have, you know, fruit of the spirit of being patient, you know, and so we thank you for that. Thank you for everybody to be patient. Thank you for getting everybody here. Thank you for getting us through this day. It's like so many things, Father. So, but we just glorify you in it. And we just thank you for allowing us to be here. Give us your Holy Spirit. Teach us your truth. Help us apply it to hearts and minds and guide us to the facts. And uh, bless our study today. And bless everybody in our group in every area of their need. And keep us all healthy and strong so we can serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Pet doctrines number three. Un this is unclean meat cannibalism and meat sacrifice to idols. That's what we're focusing on, part three. And so in our first part one, we did unclean meat. You know that there's no unclean meat now. You, you're not morally obligated to eat in certain meats. And part two, we went, went over cannibalism. You can't eat people. <laughs> they're made in the image of God. You know, they're your brothers and sisters. You know, your relatives. And now we're talking about food sacrifice to idols. So, food sacrifice to idols, the controversy. The early church, Paul and Jesus. It says, in the book of Acts, the early church was dealing with a false doctrine that you had to become a Jew through circumcision, thus obeying the Levitical law, to then become a Christian. The matter was settled upon the lines of staying away from the pagan practices and feasts. So, let us read. In Acts 15, 1-2, it says, Some men 
come down from Judea and taught the brothers, unless you are circumcised after the custom of Moses, you can't be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small discord, <laughs> in other words, they had a big fight, <laughs> and discussion with them, they appointed Paul and Barnabas and some of the others of, uh, of them to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about the question. All right. So there was a, a big kerfuffle, right? And like, I love it when they're like, no small discord. That means there's a huge fight. I mean, they really got each other's grills about it, right? It's not peaceful. Okay, next part it says the church concluded the following Acts 15, 19 through 20 it says, therefore, my judgment is that we don't trouble those from among the Gentiles who turn to God, but that we write to them that they abstain from the pollution of idols, from sexual immorality and from what is strangled and from blood. Right. And so he said, this is what we're going to tell them to do. Don't be polluted by idols. Don't get with the temple prostitutes then, and make sure you're married if you're having sex. Don't eat what is strangled and uh, stay away from blood, right? Now, the blood thing we learned about was even before the Levitical law is back during the time of uh, Noah when he got off the boat. He said, stay away from the blood. So that, that still applies to us. We still stay away from the blood, right? We don't eat bloody anything. We have to cook our food because the Bible says the life is in the blood. So God says, stay away from that. You're not supposed to be eating it. You can cook it and eat it, but we're not supposed to, you know, like the Brits have blood pudding and stuff like that. Okay, so... Now that we have that kind of figured out, Paul was sent with this letter. So Acts 15, 22. Then pleased the, the, the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch, Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Bar Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. Right. So Paul is helping carry this letter about stay away from sexual immoralities, idols, things strangled and from blood. Right. And so let's read at top of page two. This is important. We're laying groundwork here to prove what Paul says he said with understanding. The early church taught that you did not have to keep the law of Moses as mentioned in Acts 15, 1 through 2. This is the Levitical law and includes the dietary requirements. As mentioned, there is a difference between the Levitic Levitical and royal law, the Ten Commandments. So see our study for more information in the difference of the royal law and the Levitical law. The royal law, Ten Commandments, Levitical law was how you approach God and ritual cleaning and all this other stuff. That was done away with through Christ. So Acts 15, 24, because we have heard that some who went out from among us have troubled you with words, unsettling your soul, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we have given no commandment that law he's referencing here is specifically the mosaic the levitical law right not the royal law so i put in the 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 greek word here that they used for law because it really tells us something the word used here for law is as follows g3551 that's uh strong's concordance g3551 says primarily a word nemo to partial especially food or, or grazing to animals so you see what we're referencing here uh law through the idea of prescriptive usage, generally regulation specifically of Moses, including the volume, also the gospel and figuratively principle. Okay, so here we have, he said, we gave no such commandment that you had to retain the law of circumcision, because that's what they re uh, reference in Acts 15, the very beginning. And that's what we're talking about. We're in Acts 15, 24 here, right? And so he's saying, listen, we gave no such law that you have to keep the law of Moses. That includes feast days, circumcisions, ritualistic washings, food laws, all this stuff, right? Now, in our studies, we've proven that there was other laws. There were social or moral laws, right? Like you can't sleep with animals or rape somebody. And if you do rape somebody, you're supposed to be put to death, you know, and you can't have incest and that kind of stuff. Those were never done away with, right? It was the Levitical side that was done away with. So let's read what it says. Acts 15, 25 through 29. We have a unanimous, unanimously decided to choose men to send to you along with our dear friends, Barnabas and Paul. So this is, again, this is later on saying, listen, we've sent these people with you. They are now delivering this letter. That's what this moment is. Who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas who will tell you these things themselves in person. For it seemed best to the Holy Spirit and to us not to place any greater burden on you than is necessarily rules. That you abstain from meat that has been sacrificed to idols. Now, this, this is where the controversy is. 
from the blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from doing these, you will do well. Farewell. I said so. And uh, see Genesis 9, 4 through 5, as this was before the first covenant in, Levit in Levitical law, or even a Jew, and also Deuteronomy 12, 23 through 25. That's the part about stay away from the blood. Okay, so here we have Paul delivering the letters. It says, abstain from meat that has been sacrificed to idols and from blood from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality, right? And so this is the controversy because Paul seems like he goes against this later, which we're going to cover. But what does Jesus have to say on this, right? He's the definitive source. Let's look at what Jesus has to say. Jesus also declares this to be wrong in Revelation 2.14. But I have a few things against you. You have some people there who follow the teachings of Balaam, who instruct Balak to put a stumbling block before the people of Israel so they would eat food, sacrifice to idols, and commit sexual immorality. So Jesus is like, this is to the churches. He's like, listen, I have this against you. You have people saying to eat, it's okay to eat food, sacrifice to the idols, and the big giant and commit sexual immorality. And so Revelation 2.20, but I have this against you. you you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and by her teaching deceives my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. So Jesus is like saying this is wrong. Okay, let's keep going. Notice how these two statements mirror each other. Let me read again what was from in the in the book of Acts that they sent the letter with, the letter that Paul delivered, Acts 15, 19 through 20. Therefore, my judgment is that you don't trouble those from among the Gentiles who turn to God, but that we write to them that they abstain from the pollution of idols, from sexual immorality, from what is strangled, and from blood. Right? So they're in concert, they're in unison, they're saying the same thing. And if we remember in the book of Acts, it says it was the Holy Spirit that told them to write these things. And then here you have uh, in the book of Revelation, the disciple John having Jesus say, write these things down, if they're saying the same thing, right? So, all right, so let's get to some controversy. So before we move on to what Paul wrote on this subject, let's look into the life and calling of Paul and his qualifications, as it were. Then we will dive into the supposed contradiction and controversy. Now we're going to, this is, okay, here's the thing. This is why this is controversial. Like I said, there's people that teach now that Paul was apostate, that he was like inserted by the Jews to destroy Christianity. Okay. And there's groups out there that believe and teach this. Right. And so this part is actually part of, of another study I was making where I was using the Bible to justify itself. Like this person endorses this person, this person endorses this person, this, you know, I was doing the giant, you know, CSI web of like, does the Bible like endorse itself? And it does. It, the, the study is 17 pages long. We'll probably never do it in group because it's too long, but I'm just telling you it does. Okay. And this is where this section comes from. So we're going to look at Paul's bona fides or his like, you know, qualifications to prove that, okay, Paul's not an apostate. Paul's a pretty good guy. Okay. And so then we can go on to what Paul says. Okay. So Paul was called by Jesus himself. Acts 9, 3 through 7. In the going, he came nigh to Damascus. Let me stop for a second. Remember, Paul was persecuting the church. He was very zealous about trying to protect his faith. He was misguided as all get out. But God can use passionate people. God has a hard time using wallflowers, people that just don't care. He'd rather you be passionately wrong for a while and him get you back on the right path than just be like, eh, whatever, right. you know. And so if you look at all the people in the Bible that he uses, he uses some tough hombres. But that's good because they have a passion and a drive. Okay. Paul was this way. He was killing people. When Stephen was uh, killed and thrown off the temple, as they say, and then stoned. Uh, you know, he was there holding the coats. Okay. So this is this guy. So Acts 9, 3 through 7. And then the going, he came nigh to Damascus because he was going there to kill some more Christians and imprison them. And suddenly were there shown around about him a light from heaven. And having fallen upon the earth, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you, dost thou persecute me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou dost persecute hard for uh, thee at the bricks to kicks. I should have used a different version. I'm sorry. Trampling also in his he said, Lord, uh, what do you want me to do? Basically, and the Lord said, "In my rise and entered into the city, and it should be told to you uh, what to be, what you should be doing. And the man who are journeying with him stood speechless, hearing indeed the voice, but seeing no one, right? So 
this is Jesus calling Paul, right? It's like, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? He's like, well, who are you? And he's like, I'm Jesus Christ, man. What are you doing? You, you know, and you notice that Jesus took the persecution personally, right? It was his body, but Jesus says, you're doing it to me. These are my folks. You know, it'd be like someone messing with your family, right? You know, someone hurt my kids, they're hurting me, you know, they're going to pay for it. But uh, so here we have Jesus saying, Paul, I'm going to use you. Come with me, right? This goes way deeper, okay? You might not know what I'm about to read to you. It's pretty awesome stuff, but it goes way deeper than that. So let's read. It says, Paul was called and taught by Jesus. Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, right? So he says, listen, we read in, in Acts, I was called on the road to Damascus. And Galatians is like, listen, I wasn't called by anybody other than Jesus, okay? So Galatians 1, 11 through 12, but I make known to you, brothers, concerning the good news which we preached by me, that is not according to man, neither did I receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came to me through revelation of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. It gets deeper. Let's read Galatians 1, 15 through 19. Right, so Paul's laying it down here in Galatians. And when God was well pleased, having separated me from the womb of my mother and having called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might proclaim him good news among the nations, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem unto those who were apostles before me, but I went away. This, watch this, guys. I went away to Arabia and again returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to inquire about Peter and remaining with him 15 days. And the other apostles I did not see except James, the brother of the Lord. Do you guys get what he's just saying? He was saying I was taught by God for three years. That's what he just said said, I did not receive it from man. I received it through revelation of Jesus Christ. He said, I went away for three years and was taught by God. Now, we could say that was Jesus directly or through the Holy Spirit. But this is where Paul is getting his teachings. Now, we're going to add another layer, a very cool layer, layer, I think. Okay, so please note that Paul was blind for three days. Acts 9, 8 through 9. And Saul arose from the earth, and his eyes having been opened, he beheld no one. And leading him by the hand, they brought him to Damascus. And he was three days without seeing, and he did ne neither eat nor drink. Right? So he is blind. <laughs> Couldn't see. Okay, here. Check this out. Please know that Paul went away for three years, apparently to be taught of the Lord. Galatians 1.18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to inquire about Peter, and remaining with him for 15 days, and the other apostles I did not see except James, the brother of the Lord. So yeah, he was blind for three days. He got taught for three days. That was prophetic. Let me prove it to you. Please note the prophetic significance of this. In the day for a year standard in Bible prophecy, Paul was blind for three days. He had to spend three years getting his spiritual sight back, right? Much like in the Exodus where they wandered in the land for 40 days and they had to go spend 40 years in the desert. Right? So let's read the proof that what I'm saying is true. Numbers 1434. After a number of these days in which you spied out the land, even 40 days, for every day a year you will bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and you will know my alienation. Right? Let me, at top of page four, I'll give you some more proofs that God uses in prophetic calendar. A day equals a year. So when you, a lot of places, if you see it's a day or 28 days, that means 28 years. Okay. Ezekiel 4, 6. Again, when you have accomplished these, you shall lie on your side and bear the iniquity of the house of Judea, Judah. And I appointed 40 days each day for you a year to you. Right. So we have Paul taught by, called by Jesus, taught by Jesus. For every day he was blinded, he had to go spend that minute's time with Jesus to get his spiritual sight back. Right. And so G Paul is being taught. Paul is being humbled, humbled. So let's read that. This was to humble them, as I believe it was done for Paul. Deuteronomy 8, 2. You shall remember all the way which Yahweh your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, to prove you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Right. So they were a day for a year. They were humble. Paul was never fully recovered in his sight to keep him humble. Mm -hmm. Second Corinthians 12, seven says, even because of the extraordinary character of the revelations. In other words, I was taught and had such profound connection with Jesus and God. This is why this happens. Therefore, so that I would not become arrogant, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to trouble me so that I would not become arrogant. Right. And so uh, uh, Paul never received his uh, his sight back. 
So what happens, you'll see, is like, see in which big letters I wrote this to you? I've written it with my own hands. He couldn't see quite right. And so he said, what's big letters? So he, when he was writing, he had to write big to confirm that what he was writing is what he was writing. And so a lot of people try to get overly spiritual about this. It's just the facts, man. You know, he was blinded. He had scales fall off his eyes. He was never fully recovered. And God did it to keep him humble. And even Paul says this was to keep me humble. Right. So now we have Paul called by Jesus, taught by Jesus, humbled by Jesus. OK, so there. So Paul was called by Jesus and endorsed by Peter. OK, now you remember Peter and Paul didn't quite get along because Peter favored the Jews at the beginning of Acts. And Paul had to confront him and be like, yo, dude, what are you doing, man? We don't just prefer the Jews now. We prefer everybody. Right. And so they had contention. So when Peter says this about Paul, remember, they didn't always get along. So we can't be just like, oh, Paul, Peter was in on it. You know, he's his buddy, buddy. No, I was like, no, they didn't quite get along. Please note that Peter was present at the meeting on food sacrifice to idols and the debate on if you have to become a Jew to become a Christian. We read that at the very beginning. I'll read it right now. Peter was present. Acts 15, 7. When they had been much discussion, Peter rose up and said to them, Brothers, you know that a good while ago God made a choice among you that by my mouth the nation should hear the word of the good news and believe. Right? The nations or the Gentiles is what that means. You know, and that was the debate. So Paul was there at that meeting. So what does Paul have to say about uh, Peter? I mean, Peter was there at the meeting. What does Peter have to say about Paul? Hmm. Peter regarding Paul's writing as scripture. Second Peter three fifteen through 16. Regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you. As also in all of his letters, speaking in them of these things and those that are in some things that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unsettled twist, as they also do to the other scriptures, mm -hmm. to their own destruction. So Peter references Paul's writing as holy writ, inspired scriptures. That's what the word scriptures there means. It means holy writ. Mm -hmm. Right? So now we have... Paul called, I'll just read my thing. So a quick recap. Paul was present with Peter at the original discussion on the matter about food sacrifice to idols. Paul, with others, delivered the letter from the church. Paul was called by Jesus himself. Paul was apparently taught by Jesus, either physically or spiritually. Peter valued Paul's writing and referred to them as scripture or holy written. Not to mention, Paul wrote about half of the New Testament. So as we can see, Paul is trustworthy and a re reputable source of information, an apostle of God. OK, so I think we can say that, hey, we can trust Paul because the whole. OK, so Luke wrote the uh, the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts as a, a companion of Paul. Luke is the only gospel that is written by a Gentile and the book of Acts is written by Luke. It's also a book written by the Gentile. And so here we have a Gentile partying and hooking up with Paul. Basically, they believe Luke and, a, and the book of Acts was written as a defense for Paul's life in Rome, right? And so in, in that writing, we would have the whole act, the book of Acts of the early Christian church, right? So if you want to get rid of uh, Paul, you have to get rid of Luke. You have to get rid of Acts. You have to get rid of more than half the Bible. It makes no sense. And since Peter endorsed Paul, well, now we need to get rid of, you know, for second Peter, you know, I mean, so the whole thing just starts falling apart. If you just want to rip Peter, uh, Paul out of the Bible, you know, which you can't. And so now that we know that stay away from food, sacrifice to idols, sexual morality. Now that we know that, Hey, Paul's a good guy. We can trust him. Right. It's called by God, taught by God, endorsed by the, uh, the apostles. You know, we're doing pretty good. Paul's a good guy. Okay. Is Paul's teaching contradicting the early church in Jesus? Paul was there with the early church when the directive was given to abstain from food sacrifice to idols, blood, and sexual immorality. We have Jesus pointing out in the book of Revelation an error in teaching, encouraging the body, encouraging his body, the teaching, the error in the teaching was the encouraging of his body to partake in religious practices of pagans by joining in the sexual acts and eating the meat of the sacrificed animals during those acts. So we will now read what gives some people indigestion. Do you like my little pun there? You know, eating indigestion. All right. <laughs> I try. I try. Stay with me now. All right. Top of page five. So here's what Paul has to say about food sacrifice to idols. And you're going to go, what? Let's see what Paul was teaching on the subject. First Corinthians 8, 1 through 13. With regard to food sacrifice to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. 
If someone thinks he knows something, he does not yet know to the degree that he needs to know. But if someone loves God, he he is known of God. Okay. Verse 4, Acts, I mean, 1 Corinthians 8, 4. With regard then to eating food sacrificed at idols, we know that an idol in this world is nothing and that there is no God but one. If after all there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, one Father, for whom all things and for whom we live, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we live. But this knowledge is not shared by all. And some, being accustomed to idols in former times, eat this food as an idol sacrifice, He's making a distinction, and their conscience, because it is weak, is defiled. Now food will not bring us closer to God. Right. We are no worse if we do not eat or do, or no better if we do eat. He's talking about food sacrifice. To others. He's saying it doesn't matter. It's just food. But be careful that this liberty of yours is not uh, becoming a hindrance to the weak. For if someone weak sees you possessing knowledge, dining at an idol's temple. OK. Will not his conscience be strengthened to eat food offered to idols? So by your knowledge, the weak uh, brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed. If you sin against your brothers or sisters in this way and wound the weak conscience, you sin against Christ. For this reason, if food causes my brother or sisters to sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I may not cause one of them to sin. So here we have saying, Paul saying, food sacrifice, it's just food. Don't worry about it. We only have one God. If you want, if you, your conscience is good with going and getting a bite to eat there, who cares? That now that everybody's like, oh man, that totally underdoes what Jesus said. It totally underdoes what the you know undo, you know, unravels what the early church was saying, right? Sure sounds like it. Let's keep reading. It almost appears that Paul is now contradicting contradicting the early church, the letter he helped deliver in Jesus and Revelation. Yet if we take the full counsel of his writings, we'll fill in a murky picture. Cherry picking statements without full context can lead the misguided people to come to fatal conclusions. As we read, we'll see the full teaching Paul was presenting. Okay, so what does Paul really have to say on the subject? Yet Paul also says the following, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. So people at temples are unbelievers, right? They're pagans. They don't believe in God. For what fellowship have righteousness and iniquity? What fellowship has light with dark? What agreement has Christ with Belial or idols and false gods? What portion has a believer with an unbeliever? What agreement has a temple of God with idols? For you are a temple of the living God. Even as God said, I will dwell with them and walk in them and I'll be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing. I will receive you. I will be to you a father and you'll be to me uh, sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And in Ephesians 5, 5 through 12, he says, know this for sure that no sexually immoral person. So just pause at, at, at these temples. You'd go temple prostitution. That's how they fund the, the temples. You You'd go and sleep with hookers, you know, as an act of worship. Okay, that's what they did. Nor unclean person, nor a covetous person who is an idolater. Okay, that's, I mean, he's being pretty clear, has any inheritance in the kingdom of God. So is Paul telling people to be idolaters? Is Paul telling people to go and do sexual immorality? No, he's agreeing with what the early church says, what Jesus said. It's the food that's sacrificed with, uh, to idols is that we're getting hung up on, right? So that no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God has come on the children of disobedience. Therefore, don't be partakers with them. Hmm. So Paul's saying you can eat the food, but don't tar don't partake in the sacrifice. Don't partake in the sexual immorality. Don't do the things they're doing. You have no fellowship with unbelievers. For you were once darkness, but now a light in the world. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit and in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving what is well-pleasing to God, having no fellowship with the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but rather re even reprove them. For the things which are done by them in secret, it is a shame even to speak of. So is Paul telling people to go hang out at temples? Is Paul telling the people to do sacrifices? Is Paul telling people to go and be sexual? No, he's saying don't do that. You, he said you can't even have fellowship with these people. But he's saying, hey, if you buy food and eat it, you're okay. But we'll keep going because we'll just keep unwrapping this. As we can see, Paul is setting up a division here, a line between the needs of the flesh through the gathering of food for available sources and actively participating with those sources by calling the body to common sense 
concerning food and calling the body to spiritual purity concerning worship. Okay, so Paul versus Jesus. What appears like a contradiction is not really one at all. Jesus is directly talking about participating in the acts of pagans and heathens. Now he said eating sacrifice to animals and sexual contact. Also, we should notice the direct link given by Jesus to show the point of Balaam's teaching. If we look at the Acts and compare it to Paul's description of getting a bite to eat, they show us two very different activities, as the animal sacrifice in the temple are often sold to the public for meals. Before I read, uh, well, I have a commentary there. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to Balaam and Balak. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 23-31. This is what Paul says, also controversial. Everything is lawful. Well, they're, that, you know, to a group of people that want to put a law on everything. He's going, everything is lawful, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is lawful, but not everything builds others up. Do not seek your own good, but the good of the other person. Eat anything that is sold in a market without question of conscience. The meat that was sold in these pagan markets were sacrificed to idols. Okay. He said, eat it. You don't have to worry about it. It's just food. For the earth in abundance are the Lord's. If an unbeliever invites you to dinner and you want to go, eat whatever is served without question of conscience. So if they you go to their house and like, you know, in Babylon, they'd feed their enemies to their pigs and feed the, the pigs to the king and everybody else, right? So he's saying these, these are pagan sacrifices. Mm. He's saying if this happens, don't worry about it. Just eat it. It's food. Pray over it. You'll be good. Right. Because uh, we I know. Right. And so but this is what he's saying. That's the situation you're thinking. And so if you find missionaries now, they go all over the world to spreading the gospel and they never make food an, an object because it's a barrier to spreading the gospel because you're going to offend them right off the bat right. because they're trying to be hospitable and give you their best, whatever that is. And then you're like, oh, no, you know. And so he's saying, don't let it become the stumbling block. OK. And so he says, eat anything that is sold in the marketplace without question of conscience, for the earth and the abundance are the Lord's. If an unbeliever invites you to dinner and you want to go, eat whatever is served without asking questions of conscience. But if someone says to you, this is a sacrifice from a sacrifice, do not eat because of the one who told you and because of their conscience. Right. I do not mean yours, but the other person's. For why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? Question. If I partake with thankfulness, why am I blamed for the food that I give thanks for? So whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. So he's saying if you're a brother and sister in Christ and someone there who follows the Lord is offended by it, you can't eat it. I, I said this last time, I eat bacon. If you come to my house and you're not a bacon eater and that offends you, I wouldn't eat it in front of you because you're worth more than my bacon. Right? So here we have some common sense, right? Paul's like, listen, you live in the world. It's hard enough. Right? And so we're going to kind of go back to Jesus' teachings here in a minute and kind of separate the two comments. It says, I believe Paul was talking about eating meat sold as food for the sake of just eating, while Jesus was refer referencing the act of participating in religious acts of sexual sin and sacrifice. One was being a uh, participant in the act of worship. The other is eating the food that was left in the aftermath of the acts of worship. As we look again at the statement of Jesus and consider the context and that the doctrine of Balaam of participating in acts of worship to turn their hearts away from God, then do Paul's clear teaching of just being able to eat and Paul's demand to remain separate from the unclean things and people. Yes. I believe we can understand in proper context the difference between how Paul and Jesus remain in harmony. So let me read what Jesus had to say again. Revelation 2.14. But I have a few things against you. You have some people there who followed the teaching of Balaam, who instruct Balak to put a stumbling block before the people of Israel. So they would eat food sacrificed to idols and the big and this is a group statement here, people commit sexual immorality. Is this something they were doing together? So what were they doing in the food sacrifice to idols? They were temple prostitution and joining in the pagan act of worship. And the people there were saying, it's OK. You have freedom. Right. So see Numbers uh, chapters 25 through 31. And so basically they're they're in Exodus. Uh, there's a mighty people. Uh, uh, Balak was trying to get Balaam to curse God's people. God wouldn't let Balaam do it. Right. And then but Balaam kind of wanted some affluence and some blessings from Balak. So basically he gave in to Balak. He's like, listen, I can't curse him because anything that comes out of my mouth is a blessing from God. But I can tell you how to get them to stumble. He's like, what you need to do is bring in your women and bring in your sacrifices and get the men to participate in sexual acts and acts of worship and sacrifice with these people. And then God will curse them for that. So when Jesus is referencing the, the teaching of Balaam and instru uh, to instruct Balak to put a stumbling block, he is referencing an active act of worshiping. 
That's because that's what they, Balaam did. He said, get them to worship and participate. Paul saying, no, stay away from the worship. Don't do that. Have no fellowship with darkness. But if you're in the marketplace and you're hungry and you need to eat, by all means, eat. If you're doing ministry and you go to a person's house and they give you food, eat. Don't worry about it. Because to you, it's nothing. It's just food, right? Your prayer over that food trumps any curse they put over that food. But you can't go and sacrifice the meat and, and sleep with the prostitute and think you're good standing with God. So Revelation 2.20, but I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and by her teaching deceive my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. We find a wealth of information on the, uh, on the intent and the context of the statement. The combining of the food sacrifice sacrifices then eating and committing sexual act is clearly a referencing active participation in acts of worship pagan acts of worship i believe this goes back to the call of god not to be like the pagan nations and do not do what the pagans do and say is for god as we find in the following scriptures and before i say this i said this last time almost every company we buy from is antichrist now mm -hmm. they are supporting things that god attests mm -hmm. so what are you going to do I, you want you're you're going to get hurt over food sacrifice to idols and stop buying food from Walmart, stop buying food from McDonald's, stop buying food from anybody but a local local uh, farm owner. Mm -hmm. Because I dare you to find one that's not one invested through the stock market into things. Many churches do this too, into things that the Bible teaches are wrong. Let alone actively donating money and giving money to these organizations. Mm -hmm. So there is no difference. Yeah, they're not sacrificing the idol and sleeping with their prostitute, but they're using it as an act of worship to fund things that offend God. Oh, wow. You know, so how are you going to get out of that? You're not. I mean, it's impossible. God knows this. That's why he did this. Right. Yes. That's why he gives us information. I'm like, guys, you're in the world. I understand it. You know, we're going to cover something even kind of crazy here in a second. Okay. So I believe this all goes back to the call of God. Deuteronomy 12, 29 through 32. Okay. When Yahweh, your God, cuts off the nations before you, where do you, if you go to and to dis dispossess them and dispossess them and dwell in their land, be careful that you are not ensnared to follow them after that they are destroyed from before you and that you do not inquire after their gods, mm -hmm. saying, how do these nations serve their gods? Mm -hmm. And I will do likewise. You should not do so to Yahweh, your God. God, for every abomination to Yahweh, which he hates, they have done to their gods, for they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. But everything I command you that you shall observe to do, you shall not add to it nor take away from it. So what is God uh, saying here? Don't do the things that pagans do, like Sunday worship. That's why the church got duped on that. And now they all worship on Sunday. The venerable day of the sun by the Catholic Church. And they say it's the right of their authority. What day did God say to worship? It's Sabbath. Right. And so we have this constant disconnect. So this is happening in the church. Right. It's a great deception. But here we have God saying, don't do the things that pagans do. So when Jesus is referencing and in, in Revelation, you have this doctrine teaching them to do the things that pagans do and then teaching them they're OK with me. No, this isn't right. Right. And so Deuteronomy 18, 19, 14. Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 14. When you become into the land in which, your, uh, which Yahweh your God gives you, you shall not learn to imitate the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found with, with you anyone who makes his sons or daughters pass through the fire or who uses divination who practices sorcery or an enchanter or sorcerer or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer or for whoever does these things an abomination to Yahweh. Because of these abominations, Yahweh your God drives them out from before you. You shall be perfect with Yahweh your God for these nations that you shall uh, dispossess listen to those who practice sorcery and diviners but as for you Yahweh your God has not allowed you to do so right so be be different right so we have a case study given us in scripture as we close here in the same way we find during the Exodus God said in Exodus 20 23 you must not make gods of gold and silver alongside me nor make gods of gold for yourselves <laughs> well, it didn't take long. So they did this when Moses delayed. Okay, that was Exodus 20. Here's Exodus 32, 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed in the coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron, the high priest, basically, and said to him, Get up, make us gods that will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know where he has become of him. Right? So it, immediately, he's up there talking to God on their behalf. They're like, let's make idols. Right? So, boom. Top of page 8. Aaron then tried to say it was from the Lord. 
Exodus 32, 5. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before him, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow will be a feast to the Lord. So here we can look back at what Jesus is saying about food sacrifice to idols and temple prostitution. We see it here. This idea that it was it was for God, right? That we're okay with God if we do these things, and we're not. So notice how their act of eating and drinking is directly associated to their act of worship. Exodus 32, 6. And they rise early in the morrow and cause burnt offerings to ascend, right? And bring nine peace offerings, and the people sit down to eat and to drink, and to rise up and to play. Right? And so here we have this eating and drinking connected to idol worship. You know, we're getting this big, giant picture of context. The right context is key. <clears throat> so this Bible verse in this study. Actually, I, I, it didn't even come to mind. It wasn't even presented to me till later. But it totally explains... The verses we're talking about. It's First Corinthians ten five through nine. It says, however, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. What the story in Exodus thirty two six. Now these things were our example to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as is written. The people sat down to eat, and drink, and rose up to play, and explains what play means. Let's not commit sexual immorality, as some of them committed. And in one day, twenty three thousand fell. Let's not test Christ, or as some of them tested and perished by the serpents. So this kind of wraps it all up with Jesus saying what he said in Revelation about you know sexual acts and stuff and and my point that you know this is our example and then paul telling him like don't be idolaters you know and so concerning the food sacrifice to idols and what he's saying it's okay to eat but don't participate you know and people taking that that's what he meant by participation it was it's okay to join in and all that stuff when he's obviously sitting here telling us not to in first corinthians 5, uh, 10 5 through 9 so there you go <clears throat> so again, we see the intent of the act of the rebellion and the execution. Exodus 32, 8. They have turned aside hastily from the way that I have commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and bowed themselves down to it and sacrificed to it and say, These thy God, O Israel, who brought the, the, you up out of the land of Egypt. So I think we're getting a big picture. So this says, This is very different from just eating food. Food, you had no concert in the sacrifice, no participation with the lewd sexual acts. Paul says, Eating food, no matter the source, is okay. Jesus says, Participating in the pagan worship acts of sexual perversion is not okay, nor is eating the foods resulting in your participation in those acts, especially if done under the pretense that it was for our Lord God. Yet, eating food in the market sacrificed in pagan acts is of no concern to those who are not offended at the idea you have the liberty to purchase for your own physical survival. Nowhere in Paul's writing do we see permission given to participate in the acts of pagan sacrifice, to sleep with temple prostitutes, or any other act of worship, as Jesus and the early church warned against. What we do find in his writing is the call to remain pure, separate ourselves from the world, and not have fellowship with the works of darkness. So here we go. This We're, we're ending it right here. We've got two little sections, three sections. There we go. Romans 14, 1 through 4, and plus 6b. And receive him who is weak in the faith, but not uh, but not to judgments of your thoughts. For indeed, one believer to eat all things. That's, you know, me. But being weak, another eats only vegetables. Right? So these are people that teach that you have to be a vegetarian to be a good Christian. Right? There's churches that teach that. And, uh, you know, but the Bible calls them weak. Mm -hmm. Right? Because they're easily offended. Their conscience is easily seared. You know, but he's saying, don't worry about it. He says, do not let him who eats despise him who does not eat. You can't be hating on people. You don't want to eat food sacrifice to idols. You don't want to eat pork. That's fine. You don't want to eat vegetables. That's fine with me, too. I don't care. I love you. You can love me. Eat what you want. I don't care. Right? I mean, just be happy. And do not let him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Mm -hmm. Who are you that judges another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. But he he will stand for God, uh, but he will stand for God is able to make him stand. In 6b, he who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat, does not eat to the Lord and gives God thanks, right? Mm -hmm. So that's Paul saying, like, don't get, stop getting butt hurt over stupid stuff. <laughs> He's just like putting roadblocks in front of people and making things life more difficult. The more I do this, like, I'm so ardent, you have to keep the commandments. You have to spread the gospel. You have to get baptized. Foot washing, Lord's Supper. There you go. That's what you have to do. Love each other. Love God supreme. That's the list. 
right? But people get like, oh no, we need to do X, Y, and Z and add this here and there. And we don't have to keep the commandments, but I'll give you a hundred million other things you have to do. That's so stupid. God made everything simple, easy. It's, I mean, it's like, there's like, I can write them down on a piece of paper. I can put it on a napkin for you. It's so short, right? You know, and then, praise God, I've remembered the 10 commandments. So I don't even have to look in the Bible. So closing, closing first Corinthians five, nine through 13. Said, I wrote to you in my letter to have no company with sexual sinners. Well, there you go, right? That's what we're saying. Mm -hmm. Food sacrifice to idols, temple prostitution, yet not all meaning with sexual sinners of this world or with covetous and extortionists or with idolaters, for then you would have to leave the world, right? So you're saying, listen, guys, he's going to specify within the body of Christ, but what he's saying that you're in the world, you're going to be in contact with these people, and we know that it's okay to be in contact with those people if we're trying to spread and share the gospel with them. If we're trying to just go and get along and be like, that's wrong. We're in sin because we're no longer letting our light shine, right? We're passively denying Jesus to, to find acceptance, all right? But Ezra, and I wrote to you not to associate with anyone who's called a brother who is a sexual sinner or covetousness or an idolater or a slandered or a drunkard or an extortionist don't even eat with such person so if paul is saying you can eat meat and some people will try and apply that paul is saying you can go and at idol temples and you can eat with these prostitutes and do these things paul is now saying right here you can't be friends with these people if they go to temple and uh pagan temples and prostitute and have idols and do these acts paul is saying listen you can't have association with them. If they name the name of Christ and they do these things, you have to walk away from them. So where in that do you find Paul saying, yeah, you can go worship at temples and pro he's not, it's not even there. So anyways, verse 12, for what do I have to do with also judging those who are outside? Don't you judge those who are within, but those who are outside God judges, put away the wicked man from among yourselves, right? So nowhere in the here didn't Paul's, all of Paul's writing without just taking one statement out of context and not getting his full counsel on what he's actually telling people. Here he's saying, if people are doing what you're trying to imply, he's saying you could do. He's saying, avoid them, be away from them. You can't have fellowship with them. Walk away from that. Right. All right. So here we go. As we close, our closing statement says, if we can look at the issues with spiritual discernment and common sense, the conclusion becomes very clear. We live in a fallen world. Many of the goods and services purchased by Christians are from servants of a fallen world who worship gods of their own making from wealth, prestige, influence, affluence, and power. We know as believers there are only two options, worship God or Satan. If we had to give up everything that was, wasn't produced for the sole purpose of bringing God glory, then the vast majority of goods could not be purchased. As most major companies support and actively fund, right? Uh, forbidden practices by God, even abominations before the Lord. Some evenly openly worship Satan. The very money used to purchase these goods have occultism and satanic symbols inscribed on them. And we walk around with these notes in our pockets. We work at jobs to be paid with these very things. God is not ignorant of our situation in the place we reside. As we wait for his return, we are called to be in the world, but not of it, retaining our purity, yet at the same time still function within the world system to spread the gospel, right? Mm -hmm. And so so I would never have an idol, but if you give me money or a dollar, guess what? There's idol worship on that money, right? right? I'm not an idolater because I have the money. Mm -hmm. It's the country I live in. They dealt with it too, because they would have coinage and they'd have the temple of Diana and they'd have this stuff and they would carry this around with them every day, right? Cause they had to, mm -hmm. right? It's mammon. Yes. It's dirty, filthy liqueur, but like, here's the thing. God understand it's the world we live in. So I could take man's money and take it and use it for spiritual good. Right. God is not hating on me because the all seeing eye is on the $1 bill or the owl of wisdom or, or Masonic symbols and all this other stuff are inscribed on the dollar. But I guarantee you it's an occultic piece of paper. I have a $2 bill in my wallet that has occultism on it. What am I unclean now because I have that? No, come on. So if you eat food, you know, if you go and you're a missionary and you're going to India and you need to eat and you go get food, does that make you unclean? No, that doesn't make you unclean, right? That just means you're getting something to eat. That's right. God doesn't care. Pray over it. Offer, uh, give thanks as Paul says. It, Bible says, uh, Paul says everything is sanctified and made holy through prayer. Right. And so as long as you're taking it with Thanksgiving and dedicating it to God, the power and the blood of Jesus Christ trumps anything that could have been done to that food. 
Now, we know we're not talking people, but, you know, we're talking actual food in Leviticus 11 and things listed as food or possibilities for food, you know. But so we can make it sanctified holy through prayer and have a clean conscience and go about life and not get worried about these things. And then we know that Paul's trustworthy, you know. And so this is the conclusion of this series. So part three on basically foods, <laughs> you know. So I hope it was a blessing to everybody. Let's go ahead and pray. Yeah. Dear Father, we glorify you. Thank you so much for the liberty and freedom. Thank you that the power and the blood and the name of Jesus Christ trumps all spiritual power, Father, that like in me and my house, when we bring food home, we pray over it when we bring it into our house. And uh, we just ask you to bless it and be with it and be a blessing, not a curse to us. And so I ask that everybody does that for their food and everything they bring in the house. And before they eat, they thank you for it and sanctify it through prayer. But thank you that you understand and you understand our condition and the world that we reside, that we can function. Remember Remain holy and pure, but still use, the, use some of the artifacts here like m money to get things accomplished for your kingdom. So we praise you. We thank you for this. And we love you very much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. If you feel so led of the Lord and want to know how to donate to this ministry outreach, please visit boyrants.com and scroll down the bottom of the name page for a PBA link. Thank you, because boys and words to play. Boy, we ain't stuck on. Brother Lance, no.